Dear listener, you're listening to the Doctor Who podcast from Castorbus. I'm Christian Corley, and with me is James McLean, and we're happy to welcome our uh, semi-regular guest, who hasn't been on for ages, so it's really nice having him back, uh, Gareth Cavana. Hello, Gareth. Hey, great to be back. It has been ages, hasn't it? It has. Although, it, it feels like it's going to change. Well, you, you've been everywhere since we last spoke. You've been in Gallifrey. I have, I have, which, which is great. Um, I've got to say, it's a hell of an experience. Um, it's very different to our conventions. Um, you know, I, I always think of it a little bit like going to church. You know, our churches over here are generally quite miserable and austere. Everyone feels that they should go, and they kind of take that whole God thing for granted because God is clearly British hmm. in their heads. Uh, and um, the Americans are far more... Um, uh, fun and evangelical, and and they're just out there to have a hoot. Um, it, it really is. It, it really is pretty good. So yeah, but rudely expensive. You know, I had that proper. You know, I'm not from Yorkshire, but I did feel like a Yorkshireman when every time I ordered a pint, it seemed to be about twelve bucks. No, what? Yeah, yeah. On the first night, I took out eighty bucks, thinking, oh, well, that'd be plenty, including you know, bus fare home and a kebab. Oh no. <laughs> 12, 12, 12 books. That's that. I mean, that we're nearing ten pounds, aren't we? That ten pound a pint. Yeah. Wow. I don't get me wrong. The beer tasted really good, um, but yeah, it, it, it was. I mean, they would think we're um, if they come over here for a pint. If you took them down Weatherspoons, you know, like you did to Brian many decades ago, <laughs> um, they hand over a tenner and they're able to get an entire round. <laughs> Um, I mean, that, that just they wouldn't believe it. They would think we were, uh, you know, that, that they'd travel back in time. Extraordinary. I'm going to London in a few weeks' time. <laughs> do you do that proper Yorkshire? How, how much? How much? <laughs> it's been known, yeah. <laughs> how much? <laughs> uh, London feels really cheap compared to LA. Yeah. It really does. Um, but no, I, I really enjoyed it. We had a hell of a time. Um, so because I went out with Ian Winterton and, um, and then Steve Gallagher was out there and Martin Geraghty was out there as guests, but kind of their, 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 so we had a hell of a time, you know, it, it sort of, the day went sort of get up, sell comics in a basement for eight hours, go to bar, sleep, get up, sell comics go to bar except there was a couple of days we went to santa monica which was great had a real buzz seeing um that carousel from sudden impact we walked along venice beach and uh, that was cool and then one day steve gallagher took us on a like a tour around la that was quite amazing that was really sunny so it was yeah it was, it was good it was great i mean next time i'm gonna pack half as many clothes and twice as many dollars but yeah i'd recommend it Definitely one for the bucket list, guys. What What were you selling? Well, I was selling comics, um, cutaway comics, comics. Um, I was hoping to be able to sell um, Omega CDs, but the um, the morons at DHL didn't didn't deliver in time, um, mm. despite promising that they would. So um, so no CD, just comics. Um, but yeah, it was, it was, it was pretty good. We got to meet, you know, lots of other people in our rock pool. We had, um, a nice cup of tea with, uh, some people from big finish. We had, um, um, I met a, a great guy called Dale Santos who owns loads of Chris Achilleos original bits of art. So that was, that was really good. Um, yeah, it just lots and lots of people. We got to meet the people who buy our comics, um, which, which was, which was quite nice. And we got some great ideas as always. And, cut a couple of deals while we were out there so um yeah i can't moan it was it was pretty good and all run beautifully by sean lyon who's a name that we'll all know um was it outpost gallifrey, outpost yeah, gallifrey yeah. yeah and yeah yeah, yeah. Gallifrey he, was, yeah. he was the grand moth of Out, outpost gallifrey and now he just runs this uh convention incredible precision and skill so yeah it's great great i recommend it Excellent. I even managed to burn my forehead. On, what, on a, in a basement or? In the two days that I stepped out into the, um, into the sun. Um, as, of course, you know, uh, you know, as British people, we believe that we are immune to the sun's rays. And 
So I just wandered around and I had this kind of peely head then for the next week. Um, but, you know, it's all part of the look, isn't it? <laughs> so while we were out there, it was good. Um, Gary Russell was there and he showed, because um, Gary's writing an Inferno comic for us. All right. Um, and Gary showed us some lovely clips from um, the Abominable Snowman. That was, I mean, it looks lovely. I would really, uh, I think that's going to be a strong one to end this phase of the range on. Um, and the other thing you mentioned, which I don't know if you two have ever noticed, because I haven't, um, the Abominable Snowman has no incidental music at all in it, which he said caused quite a problem, a challenge rather. Oh, wow. I had noticed that, but I thought it was just because I was going into it piecemeal and I... Genuinely no score. And it's the only Doctor Who I can think of that that's the case for. Was that intentional or accidental? Uh, do you know what? I think because everyone's gone, no one could, no one really knows for sure. Yeah. I'm guessing it was intentional. Um, maybe they ran out of time or budget, or maybe they thought they could get away with howling wind or chance. But I can't wait to watch it or hear it again now, because now I'll be looking out for it. And isn't that weird? I just never noticed. Yeah, yeah, it is, yeah. It is. Do you notice that, James? Because you, you're good on these things. You notice. I had not noticed. I mean, I've only seen... I mean, how many episodes are available? One. Just the one. So, yeah. I mean, I watched the one. It never never struck me. Uh, There's the yeah. audio. There is the audio, but... Yeah. Gary was saying that it does present lots of challenges because a lot of these scenes are two men sat across a table looking at each other or someone walking across a courtyard with a little bit of chanting in the background, if you're lucky. So, um, so it's going to be. Think, do you think it could, in that way, disappoint? Because I remember, I know we talked about this before when Tomb of the Cybermen got its release in the early '90s, and I remember the reading the nostalgias in uh, Dog Two Monthly about it, and the way it was spoken of in memory. To when actually watching it was a very different experience, and it was unfortunately disappointing because I'd read the memories of a, sh- of a show that I'd never seen. And I wonder if, you know, where I, I, I don't know, these sort of big, these big ones like A Bonneville Snowman, I've not seen... I, Evil of the Daleks was quite good on audio, I remember that. I don't know. Yeah, it's, a, it's, it's an interesting one, isn't it? I, I, do you know what? I don't know much about The Bonneville Snowman. I think if I, if I had to sort of rough out the plot, I would probably struggle to do that you know the doctor arrives trying to give back a vase and um he turns up to the monastery and it's all gone a bit weird and something happens with yeti and the abbot's been around for thousands of years and he's (laughs) not great and something happens and then it all goes back to normal I, i you know i think that's probably the best i could say so it will be like looking, watching brand new old um, Doctor Who, I guess. Brand new old. You don't get that very often these days, do you? It is a limited thing. Unless we get some missing episode returns, which, you know, you never know. Well, I, I, I remember reading online, on Twitter or something, someone had observed that, that the gap between now and the last missing episode discovery is the longest there's been since missing episodes started getting discovered. Yeah. That is depressing. Yeah. It is still amazing they're finding things, though, even after all this time. And we are so lucky to have recordings of everything because we shouldn't have any of this stuff. Um, I mean, interestingly, um, I was chatting with Gary and he was saying that his job, one of his jobs when he was on the uh, production, was to destroy all the rushes for Russell's era. So that's why there's hardly any rushes or bloopers or anything like that. So we don't learn, do we? I, I, I've lost the power of speech. Why? Why was that his job? Why? What sort of job is that? Why was he given that job? Russell, well, Russell wasn't very keen on outtakes. Apparently, he thinks that they're a bit mean to um, to the actors. And once something is locked, it's locked, and um, into the shredder they would go. Wow. I mean, doubtless some stuff will have escaped because stuff always escapes. I know, but I mean, as someone who has himself been a long time fan, you'd think from not even from a fan, from a purely historical 
intellectual level, the value of any behind the scenes material, which is all, as, as you say, locked away within the environment of a production. It's just essential. It's just it's kind of mind blowing. I see the moral reasons there. I understand that. But even so. Well, yeah, I mean, it's um, I mean, it surprised me. But then I, I suppose we also lived in a, a relatively benign period of Doctor Who Confidential, which True. I don't know what the status is of that. But they might, you know, I would imagine there's someone who worked on Doctor Who Confidential with a cupboard full of stuff or, um, you know, you never quite know. But I think I think it, it was just generally something that Russell wasn't very keen on, so you know, enforced it. But stuff, it just, and it will make the process of discovery exciting in twenty years' time. But it's it's just it, it's just weird because I mean stuff from Confidential, a lot of the stuff they'll have, and I don't know kind of what the process was between the show, the production, and Confidential. But so much of the material there will be a curation process, and as opposed to a sense, that's what Davis is actually doing there. He's curating stuff that he feels would be unreasonable for ever to see the light of day, yeah. and yet that's the sad thing, isn't it? Because in twenty years' time, that is where that that is the interesting thing is that, that stuff which wouldn't get to see the light of day, which is not curated for any political reason for any, you know, studio or even creative political reasons, just to see how something existed in its, you know, its raw, worldly form. Um, yeah. I don't know, I'm just surprised. As, as Christian said, I didn't think those practices, you, you'd think it would be the other way around, where everything would be kept. But, but I understand his reasons, but yeah. I think it was, I, I guess, I guess, I mean, it, it is baffling. On, on a law level, but I think we I can rationalise it in that yeah. when they were making stuff, they didn't want things leaking out. So yeah, DVDs full of rushes feels like an obvious thing to pop into your coat or your bag on the way out. So sticking them in the shredder is an obvious way of getting rid of them. Um, not retaining them on some kind of server somewhere does feel a little bit remiss, but... Um, and... I, I mean, do we think that there's a reasonable chance of doing deluxe 4K um, Blu-ray sets in 20 years to come? I mean, I would hope so, because once the original run of seasons is finished, and they're not going to be able to do all 26. I mean, it just feels, you know, once you get to series three, it's going to be 60% telesnaps if you're lucky. Um, so I would imagine the maximum number of, season box sets you're ever going to get is probably you know 23 24 um and we're already halfway through that process i'd have thought um the obvious thing to do would be to do a lovely deluxe you know all the the russell stuff and then all the moffat stuff but maybe there's no interest maybe they feel the market isn't there but um it is odd it's an odd decision but maybe we, you know, maybe it is all sat there on a server, and we need not worry. I'm worried about what Ian Levine's going to do when he finds out about this. <laughs> uh, yes, yes, there'll be a <laughs> there'll be a ram raid on someone's uh, on, <laughs> on someone's locker where there, there's rumours to have you know piles of mouldering old DVDs. And I suppose you know this better than anyone, Christian. Um, those DVDs decay, don't they? I mean, yep. I've got. DVDRs that I burnt off 15 years ago, and a lot of those are unplayable now. Yeah, it's uh, it's a big problem. I've just uh, retrieved a lot of old stuff. Uh, as I was saying to you earlier on, I built a uh, office in my back garden, and uh, it's got a bit of a studio double purpose. And um, I've been able to retrieve a load of old sort of discs and uh, computer equipment and stuff that I want to archive. And the, the collection of discs is just insane. I'm not really sure I'm actually practically going to be able to do it before they kind of self-combust or whatever. Um, but, yeah, they do. Um, there is a thing called disc rot, which is a uh, form of uh, sort of fungus that a, a tra- that, that eats that uh, m- that uh, sort of metallic layer between the two pieces of plastic of I a DVD. It seems to lift. I've Sorry? I've some where it's lifting off it. Oh, right. So it's actually coming away from the plastic. Or is it pushing the plastic? Yeah. Or is it eating the plastic? Coming away. Um, so, yeah, I wonder how secure this stuff is anyway, even if it was all sat in the cupboard um, on 
DVDs. But you know, let, let's see. It, it, what, it, what it, I think what it tells us is the process of discovery will never end. No, but also combined with that, the process of degradation, the entropy will never, oh. you know, never end to, to sort of play on Bidmead. That's... Yeah, I mean, doesn't it make you... Uh, God bless 16 mil film. I mean, that stuff appears to be rock solid, stable, you know, unless it's been horribly preserved, like that Morecambe and Wise um, 16 mil. I mean, God, imagine if that had been, you know, something Doctor Who shaped, and it was there like some shriveled cube of 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 um of film that would be worse but these these are some of the concerns that we have i mean dvds have always been quite honest in terms of the, the shelf life of a dvd i think is said to be about 10 10 years 10 15 years it's not long before the risks of degradation take place and i've got dvds where that's not happened i've got dvds babylon 5 ones which has happened way too soon yeah um, but um, but we you know we rely on that sort of digital storage and obviously archive storages you know, even cloud storages and the like you know this this notion of trying to, to to maintain and sustain ephemeral material is is a real problem especially in a world as you say where we rely a lot on a sort of uh, a sort of digital compression a digital storage approach which does not have a longevity built into it. Yeah, um, I tell you what it does hold up really well. When I go back to my mother's, the tertiary, tertiary control, control room, all of my Doctor Who is on VHS. Still plays a treat. <laughs> Still pays a treat. You know, perfect after all these years. I've it's just dug a couple of VHSs in out. A res, in a low-res soft focus, perfect. But nonetheless, perfect. I have be, actually, before me yeah, the Ark in Space Ooh. from 1989 and more than 30 years in the TARDIS. From 1994, these were uh, among the my, my latest haul from uh, my mum and dad's uh, loft. I've lost so much because I've moved so much in my life. I've had to slowly shed and so much material. I've got still for me it feels like a lot, but it's not minimum amount of DVDs compared to what I used to have. Virtually no books left. So oh. much Doctor Who material, which just probably a lot of it went in the bin. You know, James, there was no, there was no Ian Levine there to actually drag it out. It we're going, just, the people are going to complain. We're going to get letters, man. I know. Oh no! There was, just, there was just no ways at the time because often moves would be done quite fast, and there was just no way. If I could charity it, it would be charity. But you know, hope, hope he wanted videotapes, did they? Um, well, that was the problem. Yeah, I mean, I had so many series on on VHS, and of course, then as we all did, we replicated them onto DVD. Um, and it kind of frustrates me. There was there was someone on Twitter the other day, sort of going, uh, talking about uh, the movie Star Trek. Looks like Star Trek in UK, which is on Netflix at the moment, is most likely at the end of the month, probably moving over to uh, Paramount Plus for its subscription service. And they were crowing and going, "Well, it shows these you know these people. We've got DVD. I've still got my DVD collection." And I was thinking, "Well, yeah, bully for you." <laughs> some of us, you know, some of us, especially people younger than us, sort of millennial. Gen Z as well don't have that sort of security of having large amounts of storage space for it, and that's why I lost all my stuff because I just literally did not have the space for the material. And streamings was useful for that, but again, yeah, we're coming to a crunch on that as they're all cutting up the pie. The Guardian today was talking. Guardian today was talking about that as well. Well, so there we go. So the <laughs> uh, you know the the archive challenge is finished. The archive challenge is eternal. www.cutawaycomics.co.uk is where, dear listener, you will find a lot of things that have been split away from Doctor Who, almost in a sort of quote-unquote splinter universe. Gav's been on previously talking about some of these projects. I understand at the moment that Omega is the main focus, Gareth. Well, you say Omega, I say Omega. Uh, <laughs> Let's call the whole you know, thing off. One of the things I love about the Three Doctors is it has its cake and eat it. Um, I think Pertwee calls it Omega and, and Troughton calls it Omega. And I, can't, I don't think Hartnell even refers to him by name. So it's, uh, I, I, either is fine. So yes, we've got the audio just out with Brian Blessed playing the big O. 
Um, and he loves being home again. Um, he, he absolutely loves it. He's done a great job, fine job. Um, so that's out and, and available to buy now as download or CD. But the CD is the one I would go for because there's a 100-minute commentary on there, brand new Brian commentary on Mind Warp, which is extraordinary. Just has to be heard to be believed. Some of the quality of the tales are first rate. And I think we only had to redact six pieces of swearing, which, which I was I was surprised by. I was I was braced for more. <laughs> Did you? Has there been an opportunity missed to suggest, as in canon law, that Omega's full name is Omega Omega? <laughs> oh, and there you solve the crisis. You do the double O. Um, then you've got to decide being casual and informal and the other one is being formal i like it i, I do like it i, I think it could we'll be omega that. omega 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 um like pt sigma yes no nice. i mean may, maybe the doctor's name is doctor 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 <laughs> and it's just that's why he says no one could actually understand his name in full because you've got to get the, the flow of those the different aliens know it there'll be a version of doctor that his mother calls him so that'll be the prissy doctor, you know, and then there'll be, you know, his mates will call him doc or, or professor, you know, to be cool. Um, yeah, it, it names. It's a funny old thing, isn't it? But Omega has a definite name, however we say it. And um, and we've been having a lot of fun with that. So the comics are now complete. Um, and yeah, we use Kickstarter, as you guys know. So we've just completed the Kickstarter for Gods and Monsters, which is the start of our big mcu style comic which is if it doesn't break me um <laughs> yeah, it will break me next year for sure um and all sorts in the pipeline uh, we've got uh, happiness patrol still to come uh, and we've got the inferno comic which gary russell's doing um which was supposed to have issue zero as one of the kickstarter stretch goals and we didn't quite make it but i didn't want to throw that idea away um so we are now going to chatting with gary and we're going to do a very limited kickstarter and make that a two-part series sort of inferno countdown to destruction so there's a an issue that'll be all about the world building how we got to where we are and then there's an issue which is which is all about it just happens in the space of 24 hours at um stallman's project Moldbore, which um it, it, it looks brilliant already Martin Garrity doing art. So that, I think, will be here sooner rather than later. So all sorts of fun things going on. It never ends. Absolutely. There, is there any moment or any frame where the Brigadier turns around and they're all wearing eye patches? <laughs> you know, if so why not? I keep getting asked about the Brigade leader, and my answer is he's absolutely dead in this world. He is toast. He is ashes. He's gone. Um, and I much as anything, I, I think the, the brigadier slash brigade leader has now been explored so thoroughly in the Candy Jars books. I yeah. don't think there's any space left explored for that character. I also think, and maybe this is a bit unfair because I've only read a couple of the books, um, and I know they are well loved by people who love the brigadier. I always think there's not much the brigadier as a character once you strip away uh, Nick Courtney's performance. And he is literally just a faintly bemused bloke with a moustache. Yeah. And and there's nothing wrong with that. But I think once you strip that um, character, once that performance has been stripped away, I've always thought that I, I, I wouldn't know what to do with that character in a comic. So it's never really been one that's been on our shopping list. Um, and I think it's been very well explored elsewhere. So um, Because yeah. what's so brilliant about him is, is that he is a military man who has been entrapped into working for a bureaucratical, very closely with a bureaucratical government working on the home turf. So he has this sort of weird sort of flow of being too officious and bureaucratical and yet too military and uh, too procedural in a way that just sort of clashes and creates this weird person who is... He's not quite an administrator, but not quite a military man either. And I think the amusement with him is always that tension between the two. That there's that sort of level of of an un- amalgam of those sort of tensions. I don't know. I just I totally agree with you. Soften I don't think there's any right. As they go on, they do soften him. Um, 
he does become almost like a civil servant, doesn't he? Yeah. As yeah, opposed that's... to a military man, which he is when it when it begins. And yeah, I, and I guess that's probably a safer place for the for the character to inhabit. But um, but no, no brigade leader. Um, he's 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 being looked after elsewhere. I suspect. That's a shame. For the eye well, industry, at least. Well, yeah, <laughs> yeah lovely. Uh, I'll tell you where I did go, talking this, um, and we are seeking here, but um, I went to Oldbourne for the first time. Oh! We that drove is... past there twice a few years ago. I really wanted to go, but Kerry was uh, Kerry used to live around there, and she was very insistent that she we went to Lumborn um, oh. to show the children where she used to live when her dad was a jockey. So... Uh, we missed Oldbourne, unfortunately. I really wanted oh, to go. You know, she could have taken you to see, um, you know, one of our holy shrines. But no, I would. I I was away for the weekend with um, with Catherine, uh, who would probably be listening to this at some point. So I've just added another listener, to the pile, and um, and I and I said, you know, I said, I've got a feeling it's round here. Would you mind having a look? You know, we go and have a look. And she said, yeah, yeah, yeah. So and it's it's brilliant. We went into the pub, the Blue Boar, and um, there's the, there was the guy behind the bar because everyone's lived there since they were kids. So the guy behind the bar said, "Yeah, I was 11 when that was filmed." Another guy that was having a drink said he was in school when it was filmed, and they were telling us their little stories. And I thought, bloody hell, this place just is wow. exactly what you want it to be. It, it's just superb. Did we they let you climb the- out the bedroom window? That's what they really need to do. Oh, I know. <laughs> Everything was exactly how you'd want it to be. We went, we went in, a, in the other pub, The Crown, had a very fine venison pie. And the guy at the bar, he said, no, I wasn't here. He said, but I was in the follow-up that they filmed. He says, or as I like to think of it, the worst film ever made. Um, and, and I played a barman. So I don't know what that one is. I've got a feeling it's, it's the Olive Hawthorne thing, which I haven't seen, which sounds a bit unfair. But, but he, was not, he wasn't the greatest fan of it. Um, that... No, I, I love the place, and you know, I don't know about you guys. I tend not to be particularly impressed when I see sets and locations, but this one really blew me away because it just—it is exactly what you expected. To be. Have you been, James? No, I haven't. In fact, I think I've only watched the demons once. What? Yeah. Right. Next time we do a commentary, that's what we're doing. Oh, we must. We must. Eco, eco, azal. Um, and you forget how funny it is. That whole stuff about speaking existentially, the soul is a is a very outdated concept, and it's 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 lovely. It's good. Anyway, yes. Yeah, so that's where we went, and and yeah, I mean, I mean, God, I could do, I could do hundreds of comics set around Devil's End and Oldborn and and all of that stuff, and that's just a set of characters crafted for five weeks of television and then just popped back in the drawer and forgotten about. So I think where Cutaway Comics has this almost eternal life is that every single Doctor Who story from the original run, with the possible exception of the historicals, because I don't think anyone wants to see um, the <laughs> Abbot of Amboise four-part miniseries, is, is a potential pilot for something else. They've all got something in them a setting, a character, um, a situation where you go, yeah, I could see that. That, that. That's got legs as a comic. All of them. Our most successful one so far has been Paradise Towers, which everyone thought I was mad when I said I was doing that. And yet there's, there's people who really care about that setting and those characters. So um, long may it last. Wow. So all of that's available from cutawaycomics.co.uk. Now, I know that some of them have been available digitally and in print. Is that the case for everything? It is. Um, We are at the point where we're due to do a massive overhaul of the website because it's just grown like Topsy. So we need to redo the site. And one thing that we're keen to do, because a lot of the discs are now getting out of, because each comic comes with a, a VAM DVD with commentaries and filmed extras and archive extras, all lovely stuff. But a lot of those discs are going out of print now. And we want to still make um, some of the lovely commentaries. You know, where where we, you know, we have people from the original shows 
back to do commentaries. And we want to make those available digitally. So they'll be available as downloads for nominal fees at some time in the near future. And um, yeah, we've got the, the, the pipeline of stuff we have is absolutely vast. The deals we have in place um, have got some way to run. So uh, we'll be here for a while yet. Excellent. I uh, I mean, it's a really nice website. So uh, I'm it, like re- very le- well laid out website and uh, everything's organized and it's very simple to do what you want to do. You can like look at something and read a bit more or you can very easily go and buy something. So uh, it's, uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, it's a nice storefront. I like it. But, but once we've added digital, all the digital downloads, I think we'll have, I mean, God, there'll be something like about 50, 50 things to buy, which is considering that this thing didn't even exist 18 months ago. Is, is not bad. That's incredible. You've sold out of Lytton as well. Yeah, Lytton has sold out. But the good news is, well, it, uh, mm, yeah, we've, we've more or less sold out of Lytton. But the good news is that we are doing a trade paperback of that quite soon right. to tie in, hopefully tie in with um, season 22. And our good mate, Des Skin, is coming back to to design that one. So that will be a lovely piece. And Omega will also be coming as a trade paperback fairly soon because we do this work because we we enjoy it but we want people we want people to read them and enjoy them so there's no point in things being out of print just because they're out of print our deals always allow for a uh, trade paperback and where there's demand we'll always do one so i think litten will be packaged together with the orsini one shot um and as many extras as we can pack it. due to my um one of my other roles in in uh online life is uh, running a uh, retro gaming website and I know that a uh, one producer of uh, independent magazines has recently been able to break into WH Smith when I say break into he hasn't sort of like smashed the window of his local store he's actually got uh, magazines for sale in WH Smith is that something that's an option for you? Uh, Smith's no I don't think so um, I think Smith's as I understand it, have a very particular um, stocking policy, which wouldn't include US format comics, which ours are in. But the good news is that we are in all of the Diamond catalogs, and Diamond, if you don't know, is the previews catalog that, where all the comic shops around the world put their orders into. And then I get an email from um, Diamond saying, yeah, we want 200 copies of Paradise Towers to cover A, 300 to cover B, so on. And then I just take them all off to Runcorn, drop them off, and then they get them into the comic shop. So you can, if you don't want to order from, from us direct, if you want to support your local comic shop, you can ask them to order it for you through uh, previews and diamond. So, so Smith's no, because I don't think that they stock anything like us. But diamond and comic shops, yes, yes, yes. Cool. Excellent. Uh, just for some context, I was talking about Zap64 and Crash, which are both uh, published by Fusion Retro Books, and they're on sale in uh, yeah. DeWay Smith at the moment. Very impressive. Wonderful. I used to buy them first time round. Yeah, I've actually found one. I found one in a box in the loft the other day. He said excitedly, it was an issue from... Have you heard this loony on the radio? Um, here he goes again with his old talk. All time talk on the wireless. Um, August 1990 issue of Zap 64. That's quite late in the run, isn't it? It, it is yeah. quite, it's a bit about midway through because it turned into Commodore Format. And I also found a Com- Was it Commodore Format? Commodore, Commodore Force. Commodore? Commodore Force, beg your pardon. And I've actually found a Commodore Force as well. Um, I mean, I got, this, I got these every month, so I'm surprised that I only had like a handful of them left. But uh, yeah. Well, we- kings you see the problem is that when we then ditched them and moved up to exciting new you know and we're going back to the archiving you know we threw all these things out i mean god i remember whenever i come across a crash or a zap from the mid to late 80s i just swoon yeah i go straight to the um you know the pokes and peaks section in crash yeah yeah I, where someone has, has gone to the trouble of mapping out sort of jet set willy or you know, nodes of yes odd or something like that. And even though I'm not playing it, I, I still just, just swoon and I drink it all in. I like the adverts. Uh, I mean, we literally lived as kings. I think it was, it was a golden era of, of gaming that that has never really been replicated. I don't think. No, no, it, was, it, it, it was a golden era 
marked by its scarcity, wasn't it? Because there wasn't plenty there. You couldn't... Oh, you know, it was so difficult to get hold of things, wasn't it? Well, that's what I mean. So you yeah. tap in... By tapping into the magazine, you tapped into all these video games, you probably wouldn't be able to get. You'd probably never be able to see... And you, you, it would be, it would be your gateway into a world which otherwise wouldn't be existed in anywhere else. You know, there wasn't on TV. Yeah, you, know, you didn't have networking, so you didn't have that connection of people playing games. It was very much you and a few of your mates. Yeah, and you had that and sort of. It was scarce. You had the magazines as well, and they were sort of very. I think um, a lot of magazines did this because um, DWM certainly did this. But you had this sort of like little idea of uh, a, like the people writing the magazine. You sort of knew who they were, and there, there was yeah. like a little solid community in the magazine around those people and it was replicating the letters page and things yeah i still know the name julian rignall from zap in the yeah i follow him on twitter yeah Gary looks... Russell or um you know they, these they were um they were like village elders weren't they yeah even though they were only a little bit older than us they were they were voices that we trusted and yeah and much like you were saying james about that you would you would we would see reviews and adverts for all these games and a lot of them we would never buy or play or experience but we would feel that we had we've yeah. seen screenshots and read them in the same way that we would feel that we had watched evil of the daleks by reading a lovely big piece in doctor who magazine or um or seeing a yeah. load of photos of tomb of the cybermen we felt that we'd seen it well there's a plethora of these uh pdfs of these on archive.org or crash your sinclair amiga format and it is amazing going through the thing i love doing is going through the adverts because the adverts themselves, you know, I, and again with film, cinema, uh, you know, TV Zone, Starburst, all that. Like, it's about looking at the ads and see what the ads tell you about the time that you've forgotten. What were the, what were they sort of trying to sell you? Um, I, I love that as well. Well, I mean, uh, there must be games that are missing in the same way that um, oh. That, the, yes. the, the episodes are missing and things like that. There must be things that are literally gone. Yeah, there's lots of things turning up. Not not long ago, someone found some um, a NES game that had been l- prototyped and then put away and never never released until and now it's available digitally. And they're really they're releasing games in cartridge format as well, still for old platforms. It's uh, it's coming full circle, as with many other things these days. Well, they're they're artifacts, aren't they? I mean, we still. We still yeah. crave the artifact. Um, it's why vinyl has come back. Yeah. Because, um, cause I, I, you know, I, it is a more exciting thing, getting it home, the whole unboxing ritual, putting it on. Oh, yes. um, you don't quite get with a, um, with a download. No. But, I mean, there was a real fascinating thing going on in the 80s with those video game magazines. It was that sort of shift in understanding of a market, of a young market. There was no longer kids and yet no longer, they were not quite adult. And I get the impression from what I've read on your Sinclair especially, how much that uh, editorial and writing environment was very much of its own world. They were able to do what they wanted. The sort of the voice, the informalness of those magazines, especially, say, your Sinclair compared to Crash, which was fairly formal, and what they could get away with. It wasn't quite the same as, like, the, be, you know the children's kids and even 2000 AD had done where they'd had fictitious editorial teams and fictitious characters like 2000 yeah. AD would always talk about Metquake coming for droids who hadn't worked hard enough which again was an interesting an interesting uh, sort of satire of of the nature of the merciless nature of the comic industry which I'm sure Deskin and Pat Mills have said many times but I think that was a really interesting thing that the games had that targeted that sort of young adult market, sort of young teen to young adult. And the way they spoke was very different to any other magazine. It was very cheeky, slightly innuendo, very informal. It sort of talked down its own nerdiness. It, it sort of ridiculed its own games in a way that hadn't really been, I'd never seen been done before. Brave. And I think as well i mean yes. you see things getting like eight percent or 13 percent reviews yeah going, absolutely dreadful and but they would still be running the adverts they'd have taken yeah. the money and run the advert yeah. um and then shredded it very honestly in a review which i always appreciated you know because games were expensive i mean i could afford to buy one game every two weeks broadly um 
with my paper round money. And if you bought a stinker, you really felt it, yeah. you know? You did. It was it. Yeah. I mean, I, I think with your Sinclair, which I remember reading that some of the girl, the female girl, the, some of the female uh, reviewers are actually some of the men under pseudonyms oh, right. to actually give her. And I, that sort of blew me away as well. Like the, a gateway, you know, just to say, yeah. yes, women love games too. And, you know, we can't find any to write for us. But if we did, they might sound like this. I think <laughs> there's a couple of legitimate ones, but I think there's a couple that weren't. And again, it's a, it goes back, it's a segue back to what we were saying earlier about, the, as you say, the artifacts and the sort of material that, like Davis remo- losing or erasing stuff. And it's like when you actually get to look at these spheres and the sort of cultures and how they worked in 20 years time, they'll be so alien. And it's fascinating to sort of be able to pop that bubble of what you saw and actually see how it worked in the interior. Uh, and I think that's just really interesting. Um, yeah, I, that, that era, those comics, I think, sorry, those, those magazines were fascinating. Definitely. So, Gareth, can you tell us anything about what's coming up next with Cutaway Comics? Yes, let's see. What have we got? Um, it, it shifts around a bit. Um, we've definitely got an Inferno two-parter, which is going to be Martin Garrity's next assignment for us once he's finished Faustine, which is the uh, Warrior's Gate sequel that Steve Gallagher's written, which is part of Gods and Monsters. We've got Faustine, which isn't far off being finished. We've got Omega, which is uh, Mark Griffiths again. Um, and John Ridgway back again. So it's a, that's a one shot, which leads into um, a bigger Gods and Monsters story. And we've got a, a, a one a, a one shot Sutek that's Adrian Salmon and um, uh, Ian Winston. So those those are coming down the track at you by year end. And I would imagine that we'll have Inferno out by year end. We've still got beavering away in the background uh, Happiness Patrol because the the six one-page strips that were in SFX for the last six months have finished. So we're not quite ready to unveil Happiness Patrol, but what I've seen of that is looking terrific. Um, so that's that's all there. And I've got some other um, interesting irons in the fire when it comes to IP, so it's um, it's endless. Eric's, Eric's very interested in writing another Litton series. Um, and we've talked on and off about, about doing a Richard Mace which I think would be a lovely, mm. you know, you can all hear that fruitiness. And I think with Eric writing those lines again, it, it'll be lovely. But there's, there's so much going on. Uh, the second part of Gods and Monsters will be kickstarting, I would imagine, in about three, four months. So that's Iris Wild Time, Drax, and Eldrad. Uh, so that's a Drax two-parter, which is, is really good, great script. Steve B. Scott on art, um, who did the Eldrad one parter so we're reprinting Eldrad as well which is part of that longer series and um and a much anticipated Iris Wildtime comic so Iris is joining the mix so it, it really is us doing our own MCU style lots of you know the idea is to do all of these one shots that are linked into a, a bigger story then a book will be a six part a six part story with them all in it so that's basically our sort of individual movies and then our big end game so um god i mean that comfortably takes us into 2023 um and beyond that yeah lots of irons in the fire lots of deals i tend to spend lots of my time doing the archaeology and and cutting the, the deals on these things and we see where we end up so if you want to uh, find out more about that or, or get involved or order are they still are you still doing kickstarters Oh, we'll be doing Kickstarters for everything. Yeah. Um, we can do it without Kickstarter. And I think it's a nice, it's just a nice chance to re-engage, to engage with our customers and say what you want and what you like. and gives us a sense of what people value and what perhaps they don't. And, it, and we also try out lots of brand new ideas because of Kickstarter and stretch goals. So, yeah, we, we, we're not retreating from that space. Excellent. So we'll keep an eye on uh, cutawaycomics.co.uk and uh, on the Facebook page, and uh, you'll get all the alerts that you need to uh, find out more and uh, back at any of the future projects there. Um, that brings us to the end of this week's Gas Derbys podcast. Big thanks to Gareth Cavanagh for joining us. 
and uh, thanks to uh, James as well. And thanks to you too, dear listener. Hope you're doing well. Get well soon. Until then, it's goodbye. <laughs>